Hello and welcome to the Daily Space for Tuesday. I think it's June 26, 2018. As always, I am your host. Well, not as always, as often happens. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. I am coming to you from our CosmoQuest offices and I am here to put science in your brain. Uh, so we do have a bunch of interesting results coming out today. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to let you know there's a lot of different things going on on this channel. Every Monday through Friday, we bring you the daily space for about 15 minutes. Uh, we give you a quick roundup of all that is new in astronomy and space science. Uh, tomorrow, Dr. Matt Richardson is going to do this because I unfortunately have an appointment I need to go take care of. Uh, we also have uh, Astronomy 101 taught Wednesdays and Fridays by Dr. Matt Richardson. We also have Dr. Andreas Plazas, who joins us for a variety of different shows on Sundays. Annie Wilson, who works at the Planetarium at Youngstown State University, is uh, doing art on this channel. Uh, basically, we're a collaboration of a whole bunch of different people from a whole bunch of institutions with one goal, and that is to get you learning and doing science. So if you like science, give us a follow and get notifications about when we're going live. Now for today's, uh, well, I'm not going to say top, but for today's first news story. This is a story with a graphic that is rather hard to understand. So I'm actually going to take a moment to try and explain this graphic to you. Uh, so you hopefully can just barely make out my cursor. There is a pair of stars in this image that you can see. They're actually, I think, dwarf galaxies. And there's the exact same pair of objects right here. Uh, there's a trio here. There's a trio here. These are images of the exact same field where the bottom one is a false color image of a galaxy, whereas the top set show where is the stuff with gravity in these two systems, assuming that dark matter is a thing? And this is our current starting point, that dark matter is a thing. And because scientists can never be settled with saying there's stuff out there that we can't see, detect, and hold in our laboratory detectors, we are constantly questioning our own assumptions. We are constantly uh, trying to triple check that we're actually completely right in the latest attempt to try and say yes there is or no there isn't dark matter stuff that makes up the majority of our universe's matter so it's about 24 percent of the matter i uh, sorry it's about 24 percent of the total universe um scientists working to confirm that it is actually out there this stuff that doesn't interact with light, that doesn't seem to interact with the electromagnetic force, but only gravitationally interacts with stuff. The latest experiment looking at dark matter asks, can we look at the little tiny satellite galaxies that orbit our Milky Way galaxy and using spacecraft like Gaia, measure the individual motions of stars within that galaxy and use those motions to determine whether or not there is a distribution of stuff affecting the orbits of these galaxies, or is there an extra term to gravity that we need in order to make the motions match uh, the theory? So, so let me try and unpack this a little bit better. Right now, if I want to calculate where Pluto will be three months from now, I can rely on Newtonian gravity. This is sets of equations that look at the force of gravity between Pluto and the Sun and looks at Pluto's velocity, the direction that it's moving in, the speed that it's moving in, and I can calculate its motion, its orbital motion into the future. Now, if I instead want to look at little Mercury, which is snuggled in right next to the sun, I have to use relativistic astronomy um, and take into account that, well, 
in some high gravity regions. There's extra terms to gravity that are necessary to accurately predict where Mercury will be three months from now. Now, when we look out at different scales, when we look out at our Milky Way, we would expect to be able to use Newtonian and relativistic Einsteinian gravity to explain all the motions we see. And we can, but only if we assume there's this distribution of dark matter out there making up 24% of the universe. Now, since we required relativity to explain Mercury, there's people who often ask, do we need another additional term instead of dark matter to explain what's out there? And we have experiments that look at how our background objects, uh, well, distorted by gravity between us and them. Gravity bends light the same way gravity bends the path of a falling object. So if there's a bunch of invisible matter between us and distant galaxies, that matter is going to distort what we see. And if we assume that galaxies on average, if you look at enough of them, should average out to being a disk on the sky, and instead of seeing a disk, we see a teardrop here, we see an amoeba there, well, we use our understanding of how gravity bends light to turn those distortions into a map of the gravity. Now, with this particular uh, <laughs> with this particular, and I'm getting noticed from my staff that uh, my, my internet may go bork on me at any moment, so I'm going to hurry up my explanations of these. Uh, so with these particular models, if dark matter is a thing, then how the velocities of objects in dwarf sororidal galaxies uh, um, are altered will be affected by the dark matter in the dwarf galaxy, the dark matter in the galaxy that's being orbited. But if there's a modified term to gravity, then we're only worried about what's happening at large distances. So by looking at dwarf galaxies, we won't see the effects, sorry, we won't see the effects of dark matter the same way we see the effects of modified Newtonian gravity. Um, and Big J, if they're out there, can you please come get, can you please come get Eddie? He's losing his mind. Um, <laughs> so um, we have new models. And what's awesome about these new models is they make predictions. They predict that with Gaia, we will be able to measure the radial velocity of individual stars in dwarf galaxies and use those measurements to eliminate the possibility of uh, dark matter and say there is a modified term to gravity or to say with one more peg of evidence, yes, there is dark matter and here is how we measured it. So, uh, sorry for the interrupting dog, and hopefully we won't have too much interrupting charter. Um, so, moving on, this time to another one of our favorite observatories, we have new results coming to us from ALMA. And this is work that was done by um, a team of European scientists who used a uh, ALMA to look at TMC1A. This is a star with a license plate uh, name that is in the process of forming. It is still pulling in matter from its solar nebula. It is still working on, well, getting to its final mass. But while the star is still undergoing formation, astronomers had lo have looked at the disk of material around it and realized that before that star is even finished forming, the planets have already begun to form. The reason that they can see this is they looked at the disk and if large molecules, the uh, beginning stuff that becomes asteroids or planetesimals is a better term, the planetesimals that will slowly merge together over time to form planets, when they looked at the gas and dust, if those 
planetesimals weren't already forming, they would have been able to see carbon monoxide. Because they don't see that gas, they know that the light from that gas must be blocked. And the thing that is doing that blocking is the stuff that will eventually become planets. So sometimes the things and the stuff really matter. In this case, the thing they're looking for is the carbon monoxide, and the stuff that's blocking it is future planets that will be orbiting this license, uh, this license planet star. Um, so uh, we may, we may lose connections. Uh, hold on, I'm getting notice from my staff in the other room. Oh, we've been having bad internet in the office, and uh, of course, Charter showed up just during this episode. Um, we're about to lose internet. So, um, final story of the day, um, and I will take your questions on my phone in chat. Final story of the day is scientists are working to put together a guidebook to well, how you go looking for alien life. So soon you can stick this guidebook on your shelf. It is coming to us from a team that includes scientists at Riverside University in California, and they define the gaseous biosignatures we should look for in atmospheres, the differences in how planets will re reflect light based on different civilizations existing on the surface of planets, and how planets will appear to change over time because there is life on this surface. So stay tuned to get this new guide, your guide to finding alien life, the kind of thing I never thought I'd be purchasing. Anyways, that is a shortened version of today's daily space because someone is going to upgrade my internet. Uh, I will stick around in the chat for questions. And as always, I am, well not as always, as often happens, I am Dr. Pamela Gay. This was brought to you by CosmoQuest, part of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We are sustained through your subscriptions and every bit really helps. Thank you for joining me. I apologize for the chaos. Uh, hopefully things will go a little bit smoother tomorrow when the Daily Space is back, brought to you by host Dr. Matt Richardson, who will be following straight after the Daily Space with tomorrow's Astro 101. So thank you, and um, wherever you are in the world, have a fabulous morning, evening, or afternoon. And remember, look up. Bye-bye.